Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today is a really special episode because I am talking to Mr. Paul Francis of Zildjian. Paul, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. Um, this is so cool for me because um, some people know this. The very first thing I did ever for Drum History was an episode that didn't get released, and it was all about Zildjian. And I did a ton of research and ended up just canning the whole uh, episode because I said, no, I need to interview people and get the real story. So you have been at Zildjian for 30 years, and I'll tell people your title is Director of Symbol Innovation. So um, what exactly does that mean? Well, my title used to be Director of Research and Development, but it, it, it really encompasses even more than that because um, we're looking for ways to improve how we currently make symbols, uh, new symbol models to make, or even, you know, new approaches to symbol making. So they felt that the innovation title uh, better suited what uh, I do on a daily basis. Cool. Honestly, for a company that's been around since 1623 to be having someone who's just still innovating is is really cool, um, which we'll get into all that. But what I would love to okay. hear is as far back as you can go, let's just go through the whole history of Zildjian. So the Zildjian secret alloy that we still make to this day, there's four employees that know the Zildjian secret that work in our foundry, which is about, let's see, three walls behind me where I'm sitting right now and they mix the copper and tin to make the B20 bronze and this recipe to put the copper and tin together was actually first developed discovered uh, in 1618 and what had happened is the Sultan of Turkey wanted symbols to be made and he summoned Avidus the first to the palace in Constantinople and asked him to make him some symbols. So Avidus went back to uh, his workshop and he put together uh, 80% copper, 20% tin in such a way that you could heat it repeatedly and roll it out and hammer it and shape it and lathe it and it wouldn't break. And it had such a great sound that the sultan gave him the name Zildjian, which is an Armenian uh, name, and it means son of the symbol maker. So it's really, really fantastic that Avidus I was named for the product that he made. Yeah. The alloy is already 400 years old, seeing wow. as we're in 2019. Yeah. And l let me just get into how we got to 1623 and why that's the beginning of the company? Please. Okay, so when when Avidus did this for the sultan, he became part of the sultan's court. So he worked in the palace. So Avidus was primarily a metal worker. This is how he, he knew uh, what to do with the copper and tin, and he probably knew other stuff too, like iron and steel and, and whatnot. And he... Um, you know, worked for the Sultan for a few years, and then he asked permission if he could leave the palace to start his own little symbol-making endeavor. And because he was a non-Muslim, because he was Armenian, he had to ask permission. Hmm. And the Sultan granted him um, permission to leave and go set up a shop in a section of Constantinople called Samatia. And that was in 1623. So that was the official establishment of the company. Wow. And that has to be one of the oldest companies. Um, I'm sure there's older companies in the world, but Zildjian has got to be up there with one of the oldest still existing companies um, in existence, right? Yeah. It's one of the, the oldest continuously running family run businesses that still makes the same thing. Um, I think there's some older Japanese companies, but they started off making bricks and now they're like a bank. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Just the name so continues. It, it or might be the same family, but they don't do the same thing. So it's like the same name, but it's uh, been around for a long, long time, and it, it's just really fantastic. You know, four hundred years is a really long time. Yeah. Now, before we go on further, let me ask too. Just in symbol history, the act of making kind of noise making things for like parades and military bands and all that stuff that that goes back a ways too. Correct. 
Well, the, the yes, the, the Chinese have been making symbols for thousands of years. What would happen in Turkey is that the Sultan had the Janissary army and they would march to the the music of uh, horns and drums and he wanted some symbols as well. And the, the, there's a lot of lore where the symbols were also used in religious ceremonies and orgies hmm. and, and and whatnot. But primarily they were they were used by the Janissary marching bands. And unlike the Chinese symbols, if you if you look at a traditional shape of a Chinese symbol and it has that kind of um, reverse type of cup, it looks like an um, upside down triangle. Yeah. If you can visualize that. Yeah. So if you think about that, those are handles. Um, the original Chinese symbols didn't have any holes in them. So when Avidus the first started to make symbols, and they were very, very small, we're talking 10, 11, 12 inches in diameter. The way that they would put the bell in in Turkey is they would use a, um, a, like a sledgehammer with a special peen on it. Okay. So if you visualize a, a symbol today, it's hard to, to hold it by the cup. So they put a hole in it and they you know, fed leather straps through them, and that's how they would they would play the cymbals. Hmm. So you got a, a, a different type of sound than the Chinese-made cymbals. And because of the, the combination of the copper and tin to make this B20 bronze, it's, it's just a beautiful-sounding alloy. I mean, hmm. even to this day, I'm, I'm surprised how many different ways that we can manipulate it and get uh, different sounds. Yeah. So... Avidus, though he this special formula, Avidus the first, he f- he came upon yep. something special that was unique, and that is yes. why Zildjian is still so unique, uh, is because of the alloy that he created in sixteen eighteen. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yep. So um, the recipe to make the alloy would get passed down to the eldest next eldest male member um, of the family, and really for. 300 years symbols were made the same way and if, and if you if if we really look at it what would happen is you'd have to write to Zildjian and say I need some symbols and it was kind of a made to order thing for the longest time as we get up into um, the 19th and 20th century you would see more um, maybe some music stores ordering symbols from from Turkey where they would come in a crate and there were really no models as we know of today. The different sizes might might be in the in the crate, and they would land in New York or Chicago, Philadelphia. And if you were privy enough to know that there was going to be a delivery of cymbals, um, you could get down there as a, as a drummer or percussionist, orchestral player, and hopefully find something that would work for you, which is. Uh, pretty different than than what we have now yeah really you know, there was no no hey do you have one that's a little bit brighter or a little bit darker this and this like this is what we got so you, you had to kind of uh, make it work but they were very very good at making um, symbols I, I was just talking to somebody today about having had a uh, old Constantinople K analyzed um, by a, a metallurgy firm alongside with a brand new symbol that was made and the metallurgy is on the money it's exactly hmm. 80 20 bronze with trace elements of silver and some other stuff in there too you know when we get when we talk about trace elements we're talking about 0.0001 percent so they really had a handle on making the alloy what was the factory like then early like let's say kind of in that early turkish era when they were making these because i think i heard somewhere that was very like part of it was the the open air and the sea kind of salt in the air was a part of it and, and all that. Is that is there any truth to that? I, I think, you know, those those are urban legends. You know, the where where the factory was 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 near the Bosphorus. There's there's a lot of, you know, stuff that, that's made up to to, you know, keep the mystique going on. But um you know, ha- having to have the factory near near, you know, the sea is not really necessary. The, the factory was very, very small, actually. It was just a small building. It, it, it could have even been just two rooms, one big room where they would take the castings and put it in a stone oven. Hmm. And when I'm talking about an oven, I'm talking about like a pizza oven. <laughs> you know, like if you go to 
you know, a, uh, a restaurant that, that does coal fired pizzas and they have this stone oven in the, in the corner, that would be the size of the oven. And I'm not sure of this, but probably in the very, very beginning, they didn't even roll the metal out. They might've hammered the metal out in the beginning before, you know, they had big steel rollers. Um, there was a separate room to mix the alloy though. That was always kept secret from the rest of the workers because from what I understand, there was always like relatives that were part of the the symbol making process. But unless you were a Zildjian, you didn't uh, you didn't get to go into the the area where they would mix the copper and tin and pour the castings. Gotcha. Um, but it was a, it was a very very small um, area. Like I'm I'm right now sitting in the drummer's lounge of the Zildjian factory, and it's probably I don't know twenty by twenty. And that's probably how big that factory was back in Turkey. How many employees do you think were, were there early on at, at that point? From what I understand, you know, they would they would gather family members to come in and help them when they would get an order. And then they would go back to doing what they were doing. Hmm. I think the Zildjians had, and I'm going back a couple hundred years, they would have like a stall in the bazaar in Constantinople. And they'd have symbols in there. And if you were looking for symbols, if you were in Constantinople, you would be walking through the bazaar and you'd, you'd, you'd say Zildjian and they go, oh yeah, stall number six. And you'd go and you, you might see rugs and hookahs and symbols up against the wall and you say, I want some symbols. So you'd pay them for them and they would go back to the neighborhood and and melt the alloy, create the casting and make the symbols for you. Cool. That's such a different, uh, like you said, now we're, we're like, we get online and we order them or we go to our music store, but man, such a different, um, a different time, obviously. But so going forward a little bit, um, obviously, in what I've seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, so Avidus II is more of a modern, quote unquote, modern um, player in this story, right? Doesn't a lot of it picks up with him, correct? Yes. Um, I wish I was up in the hallway because we have um, these tiles on the wall with with um, kind of the timeline of stuff. So Av- Avidus II um, w- was a very good symbol maker. He actually... Um, built a schooner so he could um, sail the symbols to the World Trades Fairs uh, and display them. And he won uh, a a lot of awards for the um, sound and clarity of his symbols versus what else was being uh, made at the time. And and the thing that people don't realize is, I I don't know about you, I have a mechanical engineering degree and I don't dare build a boat (laughs) because it would probably sink. No. You know, he, he said, well, I need to do this. So he built himself a schooner and he loaded it up with, you know, symbols and he went to the world's trades fairs, which is unlike the NAM show. If, if the listeners are familiar with the NAM show that goes Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday out in Anaheim, um, the trades fairs went for six months. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. Okay. And you display your wares. So you would, yeah, it was really, really fantastic. So he, he won a lot of awards um, in the 1800s. So after Avidus II, it went to Carapi or Carope. Both pronunciations are correct. Okay. Carapi is more formal. It's like being named John, and some people call you Jack. So Carope is like being like the Jack version of John. And Carapi was was um, even better than Avidus II as far as being a craftsman. He continued to refine stuff, but but still the way that they were casting the metal and working the metal. You know, not a lot of things changed. You know, they might have brought in more um, heavy machinery like a rolling mill. And, you know, they would have electricity in the factory with lights and stuff like that. But they were still, you know, heating the ovens with uh, with wood and, you know, uh, hand hammering stuff out um, at an anvil that was attached to a tree trunk. That's cool. So he kind of takes it to the next step, basically, and just, I mean... You're getting into the early 1900s now, correct? So it seems like the world right. is becoming yep. a different place in general. So he's he's moving it forward. There was there was um something that an older worker here mentioned to me um, because he got to work with Avidus the Third, and we'll get to him in a second. But sure. Avidus the Third used to go over to Turkey um, and see the the K Zildjian factory over there. And, you know, he would come back and say, you know, they get a donkey walking in a circle running some gears to run the rolling mill. You know, why don't they just put a motor on the rolling mill? Oh, man. So, that, that you know, some of the stuff was still very, very kind of um, archaic. 
that they were doing. But I'm 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 getting ahead of myself sure. with with the story. Yeah. So after Avidus the second, it went to um, Aram Aram Zildjian mm-hmm. that that people would be more familiar with. Sorry, Avidus the second to Karop to Aram. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, in Aram Zildjian, he was Avidus the third's uncle. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Avidus the second to Karop to Aram, who is Avidus the third's yep. uncle. Right. Obviously, they kept the company running, so that's worth note. But did Aram push the ball forward in in any significant way? I'm I'm gonna say that he just kind of maintained it. Um, at the, at the time that Aram was running it, there was a lot of uh, cousins that were working in the factory. So um, their last name was Dolgarian. Their mother was a Zildjian, mm-hmm. um, but their their father's surname was Dolgarian. So they they were like the workers during the day, and Aram would probably go in and, and melt the the alloy and pour the castings, and then the the cousins would be doing the um, the rolling and the hammering and the lathing. Okay. I'm going to just chime in with some probably things that you're going to just say. That's like just folklore. Okay. So I think I read somewhere that Aram was a member of an Armenian nationalist group and had a plot to kill Sultan Abdul Hamid II with a homemade bomb. And I read that the story... 100% true. Okay. And he created an identical carriage to the Sultan and planted a bomb inside. He parked it outside of the mosque where the Sultan was praying and wanted to blow up Abdul Hamad. I'm probably saying that wrong, but the bomb exploded a few hours early and he was linked to it. So he was forced to yes. flee the country and opened a Zildjian factory in Bucharest. Correct. Wow. I can't believe that's correct. Yep. That that story is so nuts. 100% true. Aram was a troublemaker. <laughs> oh, boy. So now we, we, we have to understand, too, that um, being an Armenian in Turkey – back then was not good. Yeah. There's there's a whole th- Armenian genocide that's still not talked about. Yeah. Um, the the Zildjians were spared, of course, because they were world famous. And also, um, it was it was Avidus the Third's father, Hiroshin, he was like attorney general in Turkey. So he didn't want to get in, involved in, in symbol making any way any way, shape or form. Because it's not like what we see today as a as a real you know, self-sustaining business. Um, but le- let's talk about the uh, the blowing up of the Sultan because this is a great story because when I give a tour, I, I talk about it. So um, Aram and um, his partners in crime, they had gone to Bucharest and found a carriage maker and they had the carriage maker make an identical version of the Sultan's carriage. And then Aram and his friends, they bribed the Janissary guards the Sultan's Secret Service, to have them switch the carriages outside of the mosque. So they had this, like, Gilganite bomb, and it, it, it's really kind of like, if, if you think about the old cartoons like Wile E. Coyote and Acme bombs yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. that's the type of bomb it was with a fuse. <laughs> and the Sultan went in to pray, and, you know, the bomb went off before he came back in. So the plan was he was going to get in the carriage and they were going to assassinate him, so... So how did they find out it was it was Aram and his friends? Well, the carriage maker that they hired to build this replica put put a tag on it made by, you know, so and so carriage makers in Bucharest, Romania. So word got out that um, the Janissary guards um, that weren't part of the plot um, found this this tag from the carriage, and they started to go looking for the guys and. The great thing is it's not like today where, you know, everybody's being tracked with their phones and their cars. Uh, mm-hmm. Aram had time to get out of out of Dodge. So he went he went to Bucharest and he set up shop there for, and, and I say this kind of in a facetious, funny way, you know, for about 45 minutes. Because <laughs> he, he made very few symbols there. Okay. But if you find one that says A period Zildjian in CIE, Bucharest, they're extremely rare. Man, that yep. is unbelievable. So, and then, then things blow over with, with the, the Sultan and stuff, and then he came back to Turkey. Okay. There's a couple times throughout history that I've read about where there's multiple Zildjians running simultaneously, be it the A Zildjian and the K Zildjian. And are those referring to yep. Karop or Karopi? And 
they would be avidus, whatever the A would stand for. So those are both happening at yeah. the same time. We'll get into that. Sure, um, sure. And uh, right now we can because so Aram Aram goes back to Constantinople, Istanbul, whatever the whatever the date is, um, and then he he doesn't really want to be involved in the symbol making business. He's getting old. Um, so he writes to his nephew in the United States. This is Avidus III. Avidus had come over around 1909. Uh, Avidus III didn't want to um, have to go into the Turkish army, which is really bad for Armenians. Mm-hmm. And so he came over. He, he what was he? He was like a, um, uh, for lack of a better term, he escorted a, a, a wealthy family's uh, children mm-hmm. on a boat over to the U.S., and he he landed at Ellis Island, and then he ended up in Boston. And he ended up working for another Armenian making candy. And he decided, well, why do I want to work for somebody else when I can work for myself? So he started his own candy business. So it was something like the New England Confectionery Candy Company or something like that. I don't know the exact name. And he had quite a few people working for him. And he was selling candy to... Um, Susan Robach and SS Kresge's and Woolworths and, and stuff like that. Hmm. So he was doing really well. And he received this letter one day from his uncle, you know, saying, you're the next eldest male member of the family. I'm getting old. I don't have any children to pass this on to. You need to come back to Turkey and take over our 300-year uh, family business. Hmm. And funny enough, I having been here as long as I have, I got to work with Armin Zildjian the last seven or eight years of his life. And and I asked him, I said, so your, your dad got this letter. And, you know, so I'm sure he was reading it. And, and I said, what did he think? And Armin said, yeah, my dad read this letter and said, I'm not going back to Turkey and I'm not making symbols. They don't make any money doing it. Yeah. Because <laughs> he had a successful candy business. Yeah. So it was actually Avidus III's wife, Sally, that uh, convinced um, him to look into it. And one of the things wa- that she said was, well, you have these two young boys. At the time, Armand was eight and Bob was six. And she said something to the effect, well, geez, Avidus, anybody anybody can make candy, but you know, maybe this simple thing would be something that you could take advantage of and pass it on to the boys because it's kind of unique. You know, your family's been doing it for hundreds of years. So... He said, okay, I'll I'll look into it. So he went um, to some music stores in the Boston area and said, when he he got into the shops, he said, my last name is Zildjian. Does that hold any significance? And they all said the same thing. If you want the best symbols in the world, you you buy a Zildjian symbol. Man. So he decided to write back to his uncle and say, well, if you're willing to come to the U.S., um, I'll take over the family business, and we can set up shop here. Because, you know, if we if we think ab- about the timing of this, this is around 1927. He gets a letter from his uncle, and you know, this correspondence back and forth. And the uncle decides, yes, okay, I'll come over and I'll and I'll teach you or reteach you how to make symbols. I guess Avidus III worked as a teenager, as a boy, in the factory in Constantinople, and um, Avidus ended up borrowing something somewhere in the neighborhood of $30,000 from his wife's family. Now, think about that amount of money back in 1928. Yeah, big time. So let, let's say it's probably in the magnitude of five five or $6 million today, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. And he bought, he bought... Now, the great thing about this part of the story is I, I got this right from Armand. So I, you know, I can't talk about Avidus II in, in detail, but I can talk about... Um, what Armin told me about his dad and how he started this whole thing up. Yeah. And he, he took the money. He bought a, a, a big garage that was ho- housing taxi cabs. And Armin said, yeah, I remember me and my brother and my dad pushing these old taxi cabs out of this this garage so we could set up, you know, a factory. And Avidus bought, you know, a box oven, you know, like a more modern-day pizza oven that you'd see now, like a metal one, a rolling mill copper and tin, hammers, um, anvils, big sledgehammers that would be especially ground uh, so you could put the cups in. And uh, the uncle came over and they started to make symbols. 
And what they what they were making at the time were smaller cymbals, um, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 inches. And they would be cymbals that would be used more for like a marching band or um, orchestral. So essentially, if you think about it, you know, you were asking about K, Zildjian, and A, Zildjian. You know, what Avidus started making in the very beginning would essentially be a K, Zildjian symbol. Yeah. And, and the reason that the symbols coming out of Turkey, even into the, the, the late 1970s, were called K, Zildjian, is because they didn't change the trademark. So when Aram took over, the symbols coming out of Turkey still said K, Zildjian on them, K, mm. period, Zildjian. Um, so the thing is, is that Avidus III had no control over the factory in Turkey because Aram signed an agreement prior to writing to his nephew in 1927, um, giving Fred Gratch uh, control of the K. Zildjian trademark and total distribution of K. Zildjian symbols in the United States. Mm, boy. So Avidus, once he was retaught how to make symbols by his uncle, he couldn't shut down the factory in Turkey because he didn't control the trademark. Let does, me ask does you. Does that make sense? Yes, it does completely. And let me ask you this, something that I, I remember reading but not exactly knowing. It goes back to the Dolgarian side of the family, which I guess is cousins, correct? Yep. Did Mikhail Dolgarian run that factory in Turkey? And from what I remember hearing is that upset Armin because it wasn't an exact Zildjian who's controlling the factory. Is that right? Yep. It, Avidus was... was quite upset about it because Abedis. okay yeah now there was there wasn't a zildjian in turkey you know uh, uh, the true lineage because you know their last name was dolgarian yeah um but th- but there was nothing he could do about it because he didn't control um the trademark so fred gretch was literally employing those guys over there to, to supply him with with symbols and they you know of course they they still made symbols for the european orchestras and and some of the American orchestras as well. Um, but the great thing, and I don't think drummers really understand this, um, the advancements that Avidus made um, in symbol making with respect to this. He went out to the kind of the name brand drummers of the day and said, what do you need to make um, music, this music that you're making. Because if you think about it, this is when the uh, jazz era starts. So you start mm-hmm. with dance bands. People would go out to big ballrooms and dance to orchestras. And then you started to have big bands. And then, you know, that morphed into um, smaller jazz combos and bebop and whatnot. So prior to Avidus Third, symbols were just being made. And as a a drummer or percussionist, you would have to go and find something that would work for yourself in the situation that you were in. And now you had Avidus III going to the, you know, um, the Gene Krupas and the Joe Jones and uh, Chick Webbs of the world and saying, well, you're you're making this style music. What do you need? And I'll make it for you. That was a big, big, big change in symbols. And... I'd like to tell one story that I learned um, not too long ago that um, Aram and Avidus, were, they were making some symbols, and they were essentially making six symbols a day. That's what Aram and Zildjian told me. He says, my dad was making six symbols a day, and, and, he, and he knew that he was going to have to do something in order to get the symbols into music stores. But, but anyway, um, Aram, Aram and Avidus decide that Avidus is going to go into the Statler Hotel in Boston because there was a big um, dance band that was playing on like a Friday night in one of the ballrooms, and he was going to bring a suitcase full of freshly made cymbals, which is kind of funny because there's no cymbals, cymbal bags back then <laughs> like we know today. Yeah. All the stuff that we take for granted yeah, didn't really. exist. So he brought he brought some cymbals, and he got there as the drummer was setting up. And, and we have to remember that Avidus is around 40, 41, 42 years old at the time. And he goes in and he says, um, a drummer friend of mine lent me these cymbals, and I want to be a drummer like you. Can you tell me if any of these would work for the situation that you're playing tonight? And the drummer opened up the, the suitcase and 
took a drumstick and started picking up these brand new cymbals that they made and started playing them. And Avidus was taking mental notes. And then finally, the um, the drummer slammed the case shut and said, don't waste your time with these cymbals, kid. Go get yourself some Zildjian's. <laughs> Oh, my God. Little did he know who he was talking to, because Avidus III really is responsible for um, symbol design as we know it today. If it wasn't for him, we, we wouldn't, Zildjian and all the other symbol companies wouldn't be making symbols the way they are. That's, um, it's unbelievable. He was kind of hustling them a little bit with, hey, what do you think of these symbols? Uh, have you? He was doing some research. Yeah, kind of like when he went to the music store before and said, hey, have you heard of Zildjian? What right. do you think? I mean, that's he's a smart guy. Right. So I, I mentioned that he was only making six symbols a day. So he was, you know, they were rolling out the metal. They were putting a cup into it. They were annealing it, heating it up, and then quenching it um, and trimming off the excess metal that they didn't need. And then they would sit at, a, at an anvil with a hammer and they would shape the metal, right? And Avidus knew that if he was going to get this thing off the ground, he had to make more than six symbols a day. Mm-hmm. So um, after the uncle left, Aram left um, Quincy, and he actually moved to Paris. And he never he never went back to Turkey. He moved in with his sister. Um, now that the family secret had been passed on to another Zildjian, so Avidus decided that if he was going to get this thing um, going. Um, he he went out and he bought some crude hammering machines. And one of them was his... All, all of this equipment was, was here when I started uh, back in 1988. And one of them was his big, big hammer. Um, uh, we called it a bumper. The, another thing w- that it was referred to as a Quincy drop hammer. And just, just think about this big, heavy-weighted kind of hammerhead with a neoprene not neoprene, but like hard plastic bottom to it. And it would go up to the ceiling. It would go up 8 to 10 feet, and then there would be a cam that would lock, and then you'd hit a foot pedal, and then um, just through p- potential energy and kinetic energy, it would drop, and it would hit a pile of three cymbals, and they and they would bump the cymbals into a rough shape. Um, and then what he did was he transferred those, and he flipped the cymbals upside down and, and put it on um, what would be called a reciprocating hammer or a hammer like Henry Ford would have used to shape bumpers for his cars. Got it. So now what he went from what we would consider uh, random hammering with hammer marks are everywhere to putting hammer rows in. Okay? Yeah. And he, he Avidus wasn't trying to make a new sound. He was just trying to make more than six symbols a day. So... Um, he was making now 20, 25 symbols a day, let's say. And because it went from this kind of random hammering to hammer rows, the, the sounds of the symbols uh, became a little bit cleaner versus what was coming out of Turkey. And this was, um, you know, kind of apropos for the, the, the big band music that was happening where you needed to have some symbols that would cut through uh, the brass sections. And... Avidus continued to go out and get together with the, the name drummers, especially Gene Krupa. And, and I hate to say this, because uh, pardon the pun, but Gene was very instrumental, <laughs> again, working with Avidus and Avidus letting Gene work through him to create the symbols um, that we know. And, and Gene said, these symbols that you're making are really nice. They sound great, but they're too heavy. They're, they're good for orchestral or marching band, but we need stuff that's thinner that we can accent and phrase on because in the beginning, the drummers were still playing time on a snare drum and they would accent with, with small cymbals. Um, yeah. So he said to him, he said, Avidus, you have to make the cymbals even thinner. And that's where the paper thin symbol came from. Got it. Because of Gene Krupa. Gene was the guy. I mean, Gene was the, the, the he, big... He was a rock star. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I've kind of, I remember reading uh, too and, and that... They would go pick out symbols and then go um, on Avidus's boat, like and hang out together yep. and just be friends, which is great. Yes, and yep. and one thing I think is important, like you just said, you said then they were cleaner than the symbols coming out of Turkey. So it's always important in in my mind to remember that there was K Zildjian and A Zildjians, and they were not like how they are today, where they're all coming from the same factory. So they were competition. Right. I mean, that's just something where again, reading through stuff, I had to kind of wrap my mind around that of. 
they're competing with each other. Zildjians were competing with each other, which I guess is something that has kind of happened throughout history. Sure. Can I ask you one more uh, thing, backing up a little bit? Something that I read that I just think is so ridiculous. Sure. I just want to check with you. Um, yep. So 1907, um, it was back yep. with the Dalgarians. I think there was a – so yep. they wanted to get the family secret to make symbols. Um but they weren't direct Zildjian, so they couldn't have it. So uh, there was a cousin, mm -hmm. Karakin, I believe, um, yep. where he wanted to go open a foundry in 1907 in Mexico City. And yep. I read that he made a mistake in his calcul calculations of the mixture and was killed by an explosion that tore off his head and encased his body in molten yep. bronze. <laughs> is that true? It's not funny. I shouldn't yes, laugh. Yes, it is. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Oh my gosh! So, so just just so the listeners understand, when when um, we have two big furnaces here um, that hold fifteen hundred pounds of metal in each one, and when when we're pouring from the furnace into a crucible, the temperature of the metal is between twenty two hundred and twenty four hundred degrees Fahrenheit. That's the temperature that lava flows at. <laughs> just so people have a reference, how yeah. hot that is. Okay, yeah. so if you think about it, um, the metal gets poured into these big open um, pots or iron molds. It's made out of a, a special iron. And I, I, I want people to think about when you take a hot frying pan and you bring it over to the sink and that you just decide that you're going to try to cool it down and turn the water on and what happens to the water? It dances out of the pan, yes, right? yeah. So Kerrigan did something wrong where he went to pour this molten metal and it literally jumped out of the pot and killed him because oh, he didn't know what he was doing. Man. So that that's 100% true. God, talk about like envy. And honestly, you can sympathize with that side of the family of, wow, my cousin, I like because of my last name, I cannot be a part of this, and I'm I'm one family member removed from being a Zildjian, but they just they can't be in that part of the family. Right. Yep. Wow. I think for now that's all of my uh, butting in with questions, but mm -hmm. um, man, that's I nope. just love those little but in. I love those little um, tidbits like that. And I well, while we're there, then I read also that. Um, Aram was in exile in Romania, and Mikhail Dalgarian traveled to pressure the elderly Aram into giving them the formula, and he was declined, yep. and Mikhail started to fight and flipped over all of the foundry tables. That's another one kind of in that era. Yep. God. Yep. Yep. Jeez. So th there's also um, – um, this is not a tr – this is, this is a true part of the story that during that time, um, there was an aunt, Victoria, that – she ran the foundry and that she knew the secret. Hmm. So, um, you know, that, that so she, she, well, while Aram was in exile, she kind of, she kind of ran uh, the factory and she knew what the secret was. So, so there was a woman kind of running the, the show for a little bit. That's Karope's daughter, correct? Yes. And there's a picture in one of the, there's, there's a, I don't know if it's a magazine or a book, and you can see it where she's standing at the top of the stairs of the factory somewhere. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know if this was true. I, I read that uh, she was the one who passed the family process to the Dalgarians and began a predicament of them feeling like they could create their own symbols. Is there any truth to that? I, I, I'll say yes to that. I can't, I can't confirm it. I would have to check with with Craigie Zildjian sure. a little bit on that, but I, I don't think the answer is no. Okay. I think, I think that's right. So let's get, let's get back to Avidus the third for a minute. So, you know, he starts, he starts establishing his symbol business. He's getting the product out into the music stores and he's doing this based off of his, um, candy business, right? You got to get it to the point of purchase. So you walk in, I need some symbols. The symbols are there. You don't have to write to them to have them made and it takes months before you get them. So, um, you know, all, all of the American dance band, big band, jazz drummers start um, playing a Zildjans. And the reason that they're called a Zildjans is not because Avidus 
said my Zil- my symbols are called A's Zildjian's, the trademark that he had to use was Avidus Zildjian, like we use on the A's today. And the drummers shortened it to A's versus what was coming out of Turkey, which were K's. So the drummers kind of took hold of it and, and made it their own. So that's where the A moniker came from. Okay. It was based off of a trademark. Okay. Okay. So he's he's doing very, very well. And he's probably selling 15 to 20 A Zildjian's for every one K Zildjian that's being sold. Hmm. So they're doing, it's a very, very successful business. And Armand and 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 Bob, they're, they're growing up in the business. When Armand turned 14, um, Avidus brought him in and taught him the secret. Let's just wrap our heads around this for a second, right? Yeah. So he's 14 years old, and dad's going to teach you how to play with molten metal. <laughs> right? Yeah, really? Yeah. And so, so, you know, Armin would melt with his dad um, during school vacations and the entire summer, you know, break from school. So when he wasn't in school, he was in, you know, pouring molten metal. And then two years later, Avidus taught his, his other son, Bob, the secret formula. So... You had three Zildjians in the United States that that knew how to mix the copper and tin to make the bronze. Mm. And then, as as time goes on, and we and the United States gets into World War II, Armin uh, goes into the Coast Guard, and I think Bob went into the Army. And um, so they were they were you know fighting for their country, and this is the first time that Avidus actually writes down the recipe and puts it in a safe in case. Something happens to Armin and Bob, and something happens to him. Somebody can come along and continue um, the Zildjian family legacy of symbol making. Sure. But uh, nothing, nothing happened to Bob. Nothing happened to Armin. They came back from war and they continued their roles at the company. Um, Armin was more of the uh, foreman of the factory, you know, mm-hmm. working with the, the the drummers and picking orders and. You know, uh, doing the symbol making end, and, and Bob kind of more more into sales and marketing, and he would travel a lot over to Europe to the distributors, and you know, so they they were really a force to be reckoned with for a long, long time. But K. Zildjian was still kind of a thorn in Avidus's backside, yeah, and he he was just irritated, you know, and and from time to time he would himself travel to Turkey, and he'd he'd go to Istanbul and, and go visit the cousins and they would just end up in a fight every time, you know, cause Avidus can, said, you know, you really shouldn't be making symbols. You're not real Zildjian's. And they are like, well, you know, we have the trademark with Fred Gretsch and we're going to keep making them. So nothing got resolved. Um, but there was some time in the, in the sixties where Bob Zildjian had heard his dad complaining about this and he said, well, geez, well, you know, I'm going over to, to Europe on business. Why don't I go to Istanbul and talk to the cousins and see if they might be interested in selling us the factory? So let's just think about that for a second. The cousins are the Dalgarians. The Dalgarians. Gotcha. Which which their name would have been changed now to um, Zilchin, which is Z-I-L-C-A-N. Some people say Zilkan, but that's not how it's pronounced. The C would have a little uh, tail on the bottom of it. Okay. So it's pronounced Zilchin, which means um, big bell. Symbol related, and, obviously. Yeah. So the, the reason that they had to change their name from Dalgarian to Zilchin is because the Turkish government decided there could be no more Armenian ending names. Wow. So they changed it to something that sounded more like Zilchin, um, which infuriated Avidus even more. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but they wanted some, you know, continuity with, with the symbol making legacy. Um, but so Avidus III agreed with, with Bob, okay, go over and talk to the cousins. So Bob went over and said, all right, well, we don't have any control over the trademark, but we want to buy the factory from you. And literally they wrote a check to the cousins and bought the foundry back that really should have been theirs in the first place. And, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying, where they were selling 15 to 20 A Zildjians for every one K Zildjian. So they were doing very well financially. Yeah. So they had the means to be able to buy the factory from them. 
so now we're going to get into how how did the American Zildjian company get the K Zildjian trademark back, right? Yeah. So they just bought the factory, and Avidus, you know, he Avidus had talked to Fred Gretsch in the '50s, and there was a big court battle. I'm sure that you read about where, yeah, you know, a jury determined that A Zildjian symbols weren't the same as K Zildjian symbols, so they weren't um, necessarily the same instrument. So K Zildjian can continue to be in existence. But Avidus went back to um, Fred Gretsch and said, you can keep the trademarks. You're never getting another symbol again. I just bought the factory. <laughs> so what that did was force uh, Fred Gretsch's hand and Fred sold the trademark back to Avidus. So now Avidus III is, is the rightful owner of the factory over in Istanbul and his family's trademarks, right? Yeah. And what does he do? In turn, he gives Fred Gretsch another 10-year exclusive distribution rate for K. Zildjian symbols coming out of Turkey. Why not make some money off of them, right? So um, so now Avidus owns the factory, the foundry over there. And um, because K. Zildjian's really associated with, with Gretsch drums, they kept that relationship going. And Avidus kept the factory going until about 1976, 1970 seven over in Turkey. Um, and it, and it was decided that, you know, this was too much of a hassle and they were going to shut it down. So, gosh, but I want to, I want to back up into history if I can, if I can yes. go back to around 1968. Sure. Cause this is going to get into the split with Armin and Bob. Mm -hmm. So at the time at the Quincy foundry, um, the Teamsters, were unionizing companies in the area. And there, there was a fear that uh, the Teamsters were going to come in and, and unionize um, the Zildjian factory and that uh, Avidus would have no control over his, his company that he built through the Depression. Again, you know, Bob talked to his dad and said, listen, I, I go hunting and fishing up in Meductic, New Brunswick, Canada. And, you know, there's, there's guys up there that we could teach how to make symbols we can build a factory up there. And if the Teamsters get in um, in the factory in Quincy, we, we, can, we can lay everybody off and we can make symbols up in Canada. <laughs> and so what that meant, meant was that they would still pour metal in Quincy. Armin and Bob would go in and, um, and melt and make the castings and they would truck the castings up like 12 hours to Meductic to... Um, you know, heat them and roll them and hammer them and lay them up in Canada. Avidus agreed out of fear that a, a, a union was going to get in. So this was going to be the backup plan. So they, they didn't know whether or not the union was going to get in or not. So they had to build this factory as kind of plan B, right? Sure. So uh, the factory's up there and they're, they're making symbols. They're making symbols called Zilcos. And it's not to be confused with the Zilcos that might have been made um, – in the uh, early 30s. So the, the Zilcos that were be being made in Canada, uh, they, were, they were rolled a little bit thinner and they were pressed into shape with a, um, with a hydraulic press and shaping dies, kind of like how we make the A's today. And then they were lathed, so, so they weren't hammered. Gotcha. So it was like a second line. Yeah. Was the company called ASCO? Was that the kind of like father yes. company? Okay. Yep. Now before moving on... Who was, is there any relation, if there were Zilcos in the 30s, was that just another company? Like, who were those someone different? No, that was Avidus just having a, like a separate brand. Got it. Didn't know that. Yep. So, um, as the story goes, uh, the Teamsters didn't get in by one vote. So, they didn't have to lay off the workers. So, um, they, they had this factory up in Canada, and they were making symbols and come to find out, um, they were selling a lot of Zilcos, and the A Zildjian sales were going down. And you know, because Avidus, you know, he he got all the invoices and all the bills and all the payments every day. He was he was seeing the decline in A Zildjians and Zilcos going up. So um, he made a decision one day: no more Zilcos. If if people want symbols, they're going to buy A Zildjian. So. A lot of the production up in Canada uh, became A Zildjian as well. Hmm. Yep. And there's Canadian K's that are a very like sought after line as well, right? Yep. So that was when um, 
when Alvidus decided he didn't want to have a factory in Turkey anymore and he just shut it down, um, some of the cousins uh, were brought up to Canada and they started to make K's up in Canada for a very, very short time. Hmm. It was probably only a couple of years before Avidus passed away. And, and the difference between the Canadian K's versus the Istanbul K's is that the Canadian K's were very flat. And I remember asking... Billy Zildjian one day said, so, you know, this whole thing with the Canadian K's, why were they so flat? Why why weren't you making them like what Elvin Jones played or Tony Williams played or whatever? And he said when the cousins had come over and they started to kind of teach them, you know, some of the, the K Zildjian way of doing things, because we have to remember they've been making symbols since the 30s, the way that Avatar III developed, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. He said, you know, when the cousins came up, they, they found that the orchestral uh, music was was the most respectable, and and they were making the symbols for that kind of genre, and that's why when you find a Canadian K, they're very flat. Uh, so they're good for like orchestral use, but for really great jazz drumming, like what Elvin Jones or Tony Williams or Philly Joe Jones would play, it was a different instrument. Got it. Um, Got it. Yeah. So Avidus Zildjian passes away in 1979, and the way that the company was set up, because Armin was the eldest um, son, he got more of controlling share because there were shares in in the company, and so he was in control. He had, let's say, fifty one percent, and Bob had forty nine. Okay. And, um, you know, if you if you read about any kind of siblings in business, they don't always get along. Sure, of course. So. It it it, it kind of came down to this that Bob didn't want to work for his older brother, mm-hmm. but they both had so, the secret. So that's probably where things get a little sticky, right? So Bob decides that he wants to divorce himself from the Avid Zildjian company and go do his own thing. Armin says you can't do that. You know this is Zildjian. You you can't go and 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 make your own symbols. And it came down to lawyers and then a judge to make a decision. And it was finally decided because Bob Zildjian was taught the secret by his dad, um, and he can't, like, unlearn it. He can't unknow it. It's his birthright to do with it as he wishes. Sure. So he can he can go ahead and make symbols. And the way that he got out of the Avid Zildjian company and got bought out was that he got the, the factory up in Canada and all the equipment inside of it. And the only thing that wasn't up there was a melting room. There was no foundry up there. Hmm. So um, it was around 1980 that everything was finalized and Bob got the factory up in Canada. Um, but part of the deal is is that um, he can make symbols, but he can never use the Zildjian name in conjunction with his product, nor can his ancestors for the rest of time. It's interesting to have these things that say, for the rest of time, you can't use your name. And I don't think it should be taken for granted that a lot of people don't realize, and I didn't until I was in my early 20s, I didn't realize that um, as we're getting to with the company he started, which is Sabian, uh, I don't think a lot of people realize it's run by, it was started by Robert or Bob Zildjian, and now run by Andy Zildjian. Um, that's just such a piece of history that is just mind blowing. So some of the the long term employees that um, I grew up with, because I've been here since I was twenty years old, they kind of said that you know they they saw that that um, after Avidus, you know, was going to to no longer be with us, that Bob and Armin weren't going to work together. And this was kind of Bob's exit strategy on how he could continue to go and do kind of what he thought was the best way to make symbols versus his, uh, his older brother, Armand. Um, so, you know, some people say that, that Bob kind of orchestrated this um, through the, the Teamsters potentially coming in and unionizing the Quincy factory. Really? So, kind of making the best of that situation? Right. So um, part of the deal, too, he can't use the Zildjian name uh, with his product or his, his ancestors, but he also was, was not allowed to sell his, his symbols in the United States for a year. So you found um, 
his product being sold in Europe and South America in 1981, and then he didn't see his product on the market until 1982. Now, you being a, a Zildjian guy through and through, what is there a major difference in, I mean, he, he, he knows the family secret, so I think a lot of people would think, what mm-hmm. would be the difference between what Bob is doing with Sabian, let's say in the early 80s, I'm sure it carries through, but what would be the major difference between Sabian's in Zildjian's um, in quality and production and all that stuff? Well, you know, the alloy is the same, but it, it was more of a manufacturing philosophy and, and how things should be done. Um, if, if we look at Zildjian, there's really, um, you know, an uninterrupted um, timeline of symbol making, symbol design from Avidus III. We, we, we're, we're continuing on the whole you know, go see the drummer and make what, what they want. You know, it's, it's kind of uninterrupted. And, you know, I, I don't think um, Bob agreed with his brother on how things should go as far as um, symbol making. So if, if you look at the products now um, and you put them side by side, they don't really sound identical even though they're um, made out of the same alloy. So if, yeah. you, if you put an AA thin crash up against an A Zildjian thin crash, they, they don't sound like they came from the same batch because, you know, they kind of went off and they started to um, do their type of R&D. And, you know, Zildjian uh, continued to do stuff um, the way that they had always been doing it. Um, and you, you got to see around 1982, 1983 that um, – this factory that I'm sitting in now started to make the American-made K Zildjian. So they did a lot of research with getting old Ks from all the famous jazz drummers and tried to really narrow down what made each of these really kind of individualistic fingerprint style symbols and how do, how do we how do we capture the essence of all these these one of a kind so we can make a, a K ride or a K jazz ride or a K dark crash. Um, in a batch of symbols from time to time because mm. I can't tell you how many, you know, old Ks that I've played uh, from the same era where they're n- nowhere near each other. Yeah, I'm sure. I was I was working on some, some stuff today where I was um, copying a, a vintage K from the 50s. Um, and, you know, just in, if you play another one from the 50s, it's, it's like totally different. Because of the, just because of the way that they did things. Yeah, man, your job sounds awesome. <laughs> to do that. <stuff. laughs> sometimes it is. Some sometimes the metal doesn't do what I want it to do. Yeah, I'm sure. Wow. Well, um, this isn't about Sabian, but I think it's interesting to for people to know too that Sabian, the actual name, comes from um, Robert's children, Sally, Billy, and Andy, putting the names together because yep. obviously he was not allowed to use Zildjian. Right. And he wanted an Armenian ending sounding name to his product. Yeah, which it does. So, yeah. It was by design. Okay. So, and I don't think we said earlier, um, you guys are located in um, Massachusetts, obviously, right? In Norwell, Massachusetts? Yep. Yep. It's about, you know, without any traffic, it's about 30, 40 minutes south of Boston. Okay. Heading toward Cape Cod. And um, another thing that you, unless, stop me if I'm skipping ahead here, but. In 1989, you guys got into, Zildjian got into making um, drumsticks, right? Yes. Yep. Down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. What's the story with that? Was that just a, hey, we're in drumming, um, let's make drumsticks, or was there anything interesting there? Well, I, I'd like to give you a lot of details on that, but um, I don't know the story. I know Zildjian started coming out with drumsticks around 1986, because I was a, a, attending Berkeley College of Music at the time, and the first time that I saw them... Um, I think it was in Jack's Drum Shop on Boylston Street. And I thought that was cool, you yeah. know. Um, I had a big, big set of A Zildjian's on my drum set. My cymbals cost more than than my drum set, which is kind of ironic when I look back in time how the whole foreshadowing thing was working in my life. But, <laughs> yeah, um, cymbal guy. So I'm, I'm not sure the story. I think somebody was making the sticks for Zildjian and then Zildjian bought a... Um, a woodworking plant down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and started making them themselves. And I really can't speak to it because I don't know the the full story. Sure. Um, so one, one, if you don't mind me just kind of riffing here a little bit, one, one of the 
the, the great things for me as a young drummer, um, you know, was to work with Armin Zildjian. But, um, you know, some people say to me, that, well, how did you get into symbol making how did you how did you end up at zildjian yeah, right yeah. so um i i think one of the one of the worst things that you can say to your parents growing up other than i want to be a professional drummer is i want to be a professional symbol maker <laughs> yeah <laughs> it actually worked out i'm, I'm just again i'm just trying to be funny <laughs> sure. um but I, I started playing the drums when i was 10 that was in 1978 and i studied drums all through elementary school, junior high school, high school. And I wanted to be a famous drummer like I think every drummer wants to be. Yeah. And um, the only thing after high school, I'm like, well, I'll, I'll go to Berkeley, you know, because I just want to continue to immerse myself in, in music and drumming. And I attended Berkeley in 1986. And I, and I realized after about a semester and a half that this – I want to be a professional drummer, but I don't know that I want to become like a music teacher or, you know, I don't know that I want to get a performance degree from Berkeley when I can just take private lessons and just hone my craft and maybe, you know, find a band to play in. So I, I left uh, Berkeley and continued to take private drum lessons from a, a, a drum teacher called, um, his name was Dick Desenzo. Um Your listeners might know his son, Dave Desenzo, who yes. has played worldwide with many, many bands. Yeah. Um, Dave and I are, are, are good friends. I mean, he's just a monster um, international drumming star. So his, his dad was my teacher. And I, I continued to study with him privately. This is in 1987. And I said, you know, I just want to immerse myself just, just in, in drumming and, and learning. So he said, well... You know, there's some schools that you can go to that you can just do some drumming. And one of them was um, the Musicians Institute out in California or Percussion Institute of Technology. He says you can travel across the country and go there. Or there's this really great um, drum school in New York City called Drummers Collective. He says it's not like Musicians Institute. It, it only has a 10-week program. But maybe that, you know, it's really intensive. Maybe you should check it out. So I, I actually wrote to them, you know, people, people don't write anymore. And, yeah. you know, I wrote to them and they sent me a pamphlet, like a three fold out page pamphlet on their school. So, um, you know, I wrote to them and said, yeah, I, I want to come down. I want to take an audition. And there were all these things that you had to be able to do for the audition. So I, I um, really went to the woodshed and really, really practiced and went down and it was August of 1988 I took the train down from Boston down to um, Manhattan and went to Drummers Collective to audition and it was great I, I, I got into the school and I, I went from September of 88 uh, to just before Thanksgiving of 1988 and it was awesome and, and the school was um, it wasn't something where you you know, you, you went went to classes every day and you passed a test. You went to get information and you created your own binder and you were to take it home and continue to develop your craft. Um, so I did that. So I, I, I came back from Drummer's Collective um, around Thanksgiving time in 1988 and I was auditioning with bands in the, the Boston area and I was waiting to get a full-time playing gig. But n not being the smartest 20-year-old, I, I was sleeping all day at home. <laughs> yeah. And one, one night at dinner, um, you know, m my parents, um, my mother was a nurse at Boston City Hospital and my father was a, was a salesman. And they said, you know, we fully support this, this passion of yours, but until you're playing full-time, you got to get a job because – You're not living off of us. You're not sleeping all day and practicing drums and not working. <laughs> yeah. So so what I did was I, I ended up calling Dick Desenzo again and said, hey, I'm back from Drummer's Collective. I'd like to come in and, and visit with you at the shop and show you all the stuff that I brought back and, this, and talk to you about what I was studying. And he said, sure, why don't you come in tomorrow at lunchtime? I have a break. So I brought in the binder that I had put together and we were talking. And I said, you know, Dick, I, I kind of have an alter, uh, ulterior motive here. Um 
for the visit, I, I want to share with you what I learned, but um, my parents are kind of on my case because I'm waiting to play full time and and um, I, I don't want to go work like in an office somewhere. Do, do you think you could call Zildjian and see if they have any jobs openings, you know? Yeah. So um, the, the reason that I asked them this is because I had two friends in high school um, that had worked at Zildjian right after they graduated. So I, I there was a connection there between Dick DiCenzo and and the Zildjian family. So he said, yeah, I'll, I'll call right now. And he turned around, he picked up the phone, and he called Craigie Zildjian, who was the human resource manager back then. Wow. Now, now she's the chairman of the, yeah. of the board. And uh, he said to her on the phone, you know, I have this young drummer here. He's back from Drummer's Collective. He's looking for a job, wondering if you have any openings at the factory. And uh, she told him that, um, there's no symbol tester positions. That's what most drummers want to do. They want to come in and they want to become a symbol tester. Um, but uh, we have some, you know, openings in the factory. If if he's interested, he should come down, make out an application, and and be able to meet with the factory manager. So Dick hung up the phone. He he gave me this information. I said, okay, I'll go down tomorrow. So I show up and I make out an application. I talk to somebody in uh, human resources. And they said, okay, we're, we're going to give your application to the, the factory manager, and he'll be calling you. So a couple, couple more days go by, and, and, and he calls me up, and I, I come down to the factory to meet with him and come to find out he had studied drums with Dick DiCenzo as well. So we start talking about different people that we know in the Boston area and different bands and stuff. And I'm excited because I'm like, I'm in like Flynn. Yeah. I have a job. So after about 45 minutes, uh, he looks up at me and says, I'm not going to hire you. <laughs> and I was like, why not? Whoa. You know, we both know the same people. You study with Dick DeCenzo. I study with Dick DeCenzo. He goes, yeah, I'm sorry. Drummers don't get up in the morning. You won't be here. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll have a gig and then you won't come in the next day. Man. You'll call in sick. And I said, no, I won't. I said, I'll be here at whatever prescribed hour you said I, I need to be here. So he says, I don't know. I, I'm going to have to think about it, and I'll let you know. So interview was over, and, and little did I know, um, the very next day, the factory manager went out on vacation for two weeks. <laughs> so bad I was at home calling the, fa- you know, the, the human resource woman, not, not Craigie, but whoever uh, worked, worked for Craigie at the time, saying, you know, are you going to hire me? Are you going to hire me? And I guess they tracked him down on vacation. Wow. You know, this is, you know, 1988. There's no cell phones, yeah. you know. So they found him and said, hey, you know, do you think that, you know, you want to have the kid come in and work? And he said, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, he's like, whatever. So, <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, you know, it was it was day one. I show up. Uh, the factory at the time worked from 6 to 2.30. And I got here at 6. They handed me a pair of safety glasses and a pair of gloves and a broom, and I swept the factory floor. And... That was that was kind of the morning, and they, they they didn't know what to do with me. They didn't know what to have me do because the factory manager wasn't there yet. Um, and in the afternoon, they said, "Well, what, look, come up to the front office. We're we're going to decorate for Christmas." So I hung Christmas decorations in the in the lobby with one of the guys from the melt room. So a guy that knew the Zildjian secret and me were hanging <laughs> garlands and Christmas ornaments in the front office, which I thought was fantastic. Eclectic first day. Um, so, you know, I, I did some kind of menial jobs for the next two weeks and then they decided that I was too little to work out in the oven room because it was really, really backbreaking work back Mm. then. And they decided, well, maybe we'll teach you how to lathe. So they started to teach me how to lathe and I learned how to lathe the bottoms of the cymbals first. And I was very excited because I was making the instrument that I had been playing. Um... And I, I was a really quick study w- with that, with um, lathing. And you, you always begin on the on the bottom side of the cymbals, and they always get something like a new beat bottom for you to learn how to lathe on because they're heavy, mm-hmm. and you can't really mess it up. So then I moved into, you know, some bigger size cymbals, some thinner cymbals, and then they started to teach me how to lathe chinas and splashes. And um, I would say it was after about two or three or four months uh, it was decided, well, why don't we see if we can teach him how to lathe the top side of the symbol, which is called finish lathing. Hmm. And you really have to develop a, a, a touch to be able to do that, especially with the thinner stuff. 
and I, I was just I was just very excited to to be working at Zolgen, um, which again I thought was only going to be for six months. Will I get a full time playing gig? Yeah. Um, but they started to teach me all these different uh, models to lathe on the top side. I was doing chinas and splashes and paper thin crashes. And I started enjoying getting paid every week and the dental insurance and yeah. the health insurance and the bonuses. So yeah. I said, maybe I do this full time and I play drums part time. Nothing wrong with that. So that's how I got into cymbal making. And, you know, people say, well, you know, how, how, how do you learn how to make cymbals? And I said, there's only one way. You have to work at a cymbal factory. There's no college degree in cymbal making. Yeah. It's almost um, like an apprenticeship uh, kind of thing. And, yeah. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess for some folks, it's like you have to know someone and you have to get in. But um, there's something to that choice of, okay, so the percentage of people who can actually play the drums for a living on a daily basis is obviously pretty small. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to not work in the drum industry. And you're a prime example of that. 30 years later, doing what you love and... Um, And it's, I mean, you're the symbol guy. So I think that's like a very inspirational story. It's pretty fantastic when I look back on it, you know. Um, I wouldn't change a thing, you know, if I I could, because it's really, really great. Um, I laid symbols for seven years. Um, The the Zildjian family, they hired a new uh, vice president for manufacturing, and he came in and he started to make some changes with regard to how we looked at quality and how we looked at product development. And he hired a, a new quality manager and the quality manager was was in charge of um, uh, the product development aspect as well. So that department got beefed up and I bid on a job um, to go into R&D. And, and, I, and, I, and I won the job and I started um, in the R&D department in 1995. And the first symbol project that I worked on was um, the Azuka range with Alex Acuna. And I wish I knew then what I knew now because I would have probably made the symbols differently. But it, it was fun because I was about, I don't know, 26 or 27 years old. And here I am. I get to, you know, work with some famous drummers and also, you know, have a hand in the development of new symbols for such an iconic brand that's been around for hundreds of years. It was just very, very exciting. Um, went from the Azuka line and um, oh, one of the things that I got to see kind of unfold in front of my eyes when I was still a lathe operator was the development of the A Custom series. Yeah. So I w- I, I've been here long enough where there, you know, I remember when there was no A Custom, there was no K Custom Dark, there was no K Constantinople, Corope, Avidus, any of that. We, we made A's, we made K's, we made Z's. If people remember what the Z line was, that was a... Um, an unlathed symbol with uh, different types of uh, hammering techniques, and it was a brilliant finish. Yeah, big, thick, um, thick symbols. Yeah, yeah, they were, you know, like for heavy metal music. Sure. And then we also made a B8 alloy, a non-Zildjian family alloy uh, called Amir. So that 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 was it. And now now we have, you know, branches off of a family tree. We have derivatives of the A's and K's and stuff like that. And it's really exciting. And um, I remember in 1989, you know, if you remember the back of Modern Drummer magazine, you'd see Vinnie Kaliuta and Dave Weckl sitting uh, in the Zildjian Drummer's Lounge in front of a K Custom Ride because a lot of the drummers were playing a lot of jazz fusion and stuff. And they were playing a lot of brilliant Finnish K's and KZ hi-hats. And then all of a sudden stuff started to change and drummers were, were going back and, and going back and finding some um, A sounds, thinner A sounds, and they were talking to Armand about it. And the A's that were being made at the time, they were a little bit heavier, they had some higher curvatures, and this was all by design throughout the 70s to cut through the Marshall stacks with the, with the you know, loud rock bands. Sure. But... Some, some of these drummers that were playing the Ks were going back to some of the, the thinner um, A's that did exist from the 50s and 60s. And they were talking to Armand about, hey, wouldn't it be great to make these style symbols again? And he, he was working on it hmm. um, with, with the people in R&D at the time back in 19, 
um, it was around 1990. And I remember Vinnie Caliuta coming into the factory and working with Armand on it. And I like literally couldn't talk because here's Vinnie Caliuta. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, pl- playing, you know, um, paradiddles on, on the table next to my lathe. Um, and it, it was just really, really cool as a, as a young young drummer watching something kind of unfold that became an iconic cymbal line. Yeah, really. I, I remember getting my, you know, my first, I think it was a 16-inch A Custom Fast Crash, and you get your VHS tape that has Vinny talking about the brand new line of, of new A Customs and uh, it just being the coolest yep. thing in the world to pop in the VCR and, and watch. And Now, let me ask you, what is your yeah. favorite cymbal? What's your favorite kind of oh, boy. line of Zildjian's? That, that's really tough because I like them all. You know, I've I've been fortunate enough to you know kind of have a hand in in everything that we've developed over the years. So every everything is meaningful to me. Every every symbol project, symbol design, whether it, it's the very very kind of basic entry level, what we call Planet Z, mm-hmm. all the way up to K Constantinople. You know w- what we try to do at Zildjian is is depending on the price point that you can afford, that you get the best Zildjian symbol that you can afford. Absolutely. So, you know, er- everything is made here in the Norwell factory. So, um, you know, we want to put as much design effort into, you know, a Planet Z as a, as a, a K Constantinople, so you get that Zildjian quality. Does that make sense? I don't want to sound corny, but, no, it... you know, we really, we do stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when when you receive it, we want you to be happy that you're you're getting that Zildjian, um, that Zildjian quality um, in the symbols that you just bought, regardless of you know what sound textures yeah. they are. Yeah, and and I think you probably realize this, but and again, not to be corny, but I equate being thirteen years old and getting my first um like 12 or 13 years old and getting a zbt crash and it being like wow i've upgraded from my junk that came with my little toy drum set to then you get a a custom then you expand into this then you buy a used Mm -hmm. drum set that comes with some 70s uh old zildjans and you get some new i got some new beats with it and i equate different zildjian lines to different parts of um different eras of my like kind of drumming evolution growing up um so it's just really cool not not many not many companies uh brands can do that can i tell you about me buying my very first soldier symbol please do so i was i was a freshman in high school i was i was 14 years old and i had a paper route i had a hundred paper paper route back then and i decided you know, that Christmas with my Christmas tips from my paper route, I was going to buy a Zildjian symbol. I wanted to, I wanted to be a part of the club, you know? <laughs> yes. I want, I'm, I'm, it, it, I'm going to get the symbols that my heroes play, yeah. you know? So I remember, I remember, um, you know, getting all these Christmas tips, and I got about $127 that year. Um, and this was 1982, yeah, that's pretty, I think. That's pretty good. That was pretty good. That was a lot of money back then. Yeah. And um, Dick Desenzo had just opened up his drum store in, in Quincy, and um, I, I didn't I didn't know him. I just I had friends in in high school that had gone to the the store and had come back to to um, you know the band room and said, hey, you got to check out this drum store that just opened up and and you know over over in near West Quincy. So like I I took all this in. You know, I, w- I was part of the uh, the drum line in the marching band in high school, and being very young, I was listening to the older drummers talk about this drum store. So I remember, I remember uh, having all this money, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna buy a Zildjian cymbal, and and I didn't know if I had enough money or whatnot. But, yeah. But I remember calling the store, and it was like a Saturday, and um, ironically enough, it was Dave Desenzo that answered the phone because Dave and I are the same age; we're both 51. And I, I said, I, I want to buy a Zildjian cymbal. And, and, and he said, so, so what, what kind of music do you play? I said, well, I play rock music. <laughs> and he goes, well, do you know what, what model you want? I said, I think I, think I want a crash cymbal. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, you know, we have Zildjian rock crashes. 
And I said, okay. He says, well, we have 16s and 17s and 18s. And I said, oh, 18. How much does an 18-inch rock crash cost? And he said, it's $100. I'm like, okay, perfect. I have enough money, right? Yeah. So I convinced my older brother. My brother is eight years older than me. I convinced him to drive me to the store. And he doesn't want to. He wants to have nothing to do with his younger brother, especially buying <laughs> another noisemaker, yeah. right? Yeah. So I said, no, no, I just, I, I'm going to go in and it's all set and I'm going to pay for it. And then I'll come right back out. Five minutes, right? Okay. So he drives me to the, this drum store. This is the first time that I'm walking into it. And I walk in and I see all the drum, all the drum sets and they're set up on shelves up, up above the, um, the floor and it's like angels started singing. I like I was in heaven <laughs> as a fourteen year old drummer, right? Yeah. I'm like, Holy crap, this is all the stuff that I was seeing in the magazines and, and catalogs. So um here comes this other young young guy behind the counter and goes, Hi, can I help you? I said, Yeah, I just called up, you know, like a half an hour ago. I'm looking for an eighteen inch rock crash. He goes, Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. And so he goes to the bin and he pulls it out and here's this 18 inch rock crash, Zildjian rock crash in the plastic bag. He pulls it out, he puts it on the counter. I'm looking at it and it's like a work of art to me, right? <laughs> yeah. So he disappears and I didn't know where he went. And and come to find out, um, because he was the same age as me, he couldn't do any of the transactions. So he went and got his dad. So Dick DeCenzo came out and he said, hi, you know, I'm Dick. I, I own the shop. I run the shop. You know, what's your name? And, you know, I said, oh, I, you know, I want to buy the symbol. And, you know, I have enough money. And he goes, oh, okay, that's great. So, you know, it's $100. And then with the tax, it's 105 And so, you know, he's going to write up the sale. And he goes, oh, but, hey, do you need a, a symbol stand? And I said, oh, yeah, uh, maybe. You know, and I'm, I'm trying to be very, very respectful. And I know there, there's just no way I have enough money for a symbol and a symbol stand. Yeah. You know, because before he came out, I was looking at the symbol stands. And... He goes, well, why don't you come over here with me and we, we can look at them together. And, you know, being brought up to respect your elders, you know, I didn't say no. So I walked over with him and I kind of looked and, you know, I found this really inexpensive stand. It was a Royce symbol stand. I think it was made in Taiwan. Sure, it, yeah. it was $27, okay? So I only have $127. I'm like, you know, I don't have enough money with the tax for yeah. the symbol and then it's going to be taxed on the symbol stand. So I said... No, you know, it's all right. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just buy the symbol today and I'll get a stand another time. And, and Dick kind of looked at me and he, and he goes, well, how much money do you have? And I said, well, I don't have enough for both in the tax. He goes, yeah, but how much do you have with you? And I said, well, I have $127. And he goes, let me see what I can do. <laughs> and I go, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. You know, I, I know I don't have enough. And, and, you know, not being the brightest bulb on the tree... <laughs> I realized that, you know, he owned the shop. He can he can work the numbers however he wants, yeah. right? Yeah. So he says, well, which stand were you looking at? And I pulled out the Royce one. He goes, okay, all right, yeah. He says, why don't you give me all your money and you can go home with a, a stand and the symbol. And I couldn't believe it, right? So I have the stuff. My brother's out front beeping the horn because now I'm in there for like 15, 20 <laughs> minutes, right? Yeah. And... As I'm about to walk out, Dick says, well, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second, I have something for you. And he ran into the back and he came back out with a drummer setup book from 1982 and a Zildjian bumper sticker oh, cool. for me. And I still have them. That's awesome. Um, unfortunately, I don't still have the symbol. Um, the symbol fell over in the basement like a year later and got a ding in the edge and then developed a crack. Sure. Um, um, so that 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 symbol's gone, but I have the story. Oh my of god! Yeah, Man. him treating me like I was an adult. Absolutely, and it's just so cool that it's all based around Zildjian, which has become a yes. massive part of your life. That is unbelievable. Yes, that is great, and I think that's a perfect way to wrap up and just say that. I'm sure everyone else out there has their Zildjian story, which I would love to hear. So if people out there do have a Zildjian story, um, you can send it to me and I'll pass it along to Paul because I'm sure you'd love to to hear it. Um, and also I'll tell people um, where I found you is actually on Instagram as uh, the Symbol Craftsman or just Symbol Craftsman. Yeah. And and you post some really cool stuff, just kind of behind the scenes stuff at the, at the factory. Um, so I think people can, you know, get in touch with you there and, and obviously 
can find the Zildjian website, which is very easy to find. Um, Paul, you are a wealth of knowledge about Zildjian. I can just, the, the passion just oh. bleeds out of you, man. I, I love it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I enjoyed this. We, I almost want to ask to do a part two. I can get into different projects over the years and how they came to be. Well, I would love to. And honestly, the one thing as I was, it's, it's kind of funny with Zildjian because it's like, we just did the whole company history without getting too far into, um, then the new beats came around, right. then the A customs, then this and this, and just more about the products. Mm-hmm. So I would love to do, we'll, we'll set up a part two down the road. That would be great. Can I leave you with um, with one thing, just just for your listeners about you know how Zildjian um, views views things? Please. Um, you know what what I was taught, and and a lot of my colleagues kind of learned was um, you know the 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 company follows the music. We're, we want to make the symbols that will allow you uh, to express yourself and make music. You know so. We, we, we're, we're always looking to see where music is going. And, and really, that's that unbroken line from Avidus sure. to, to Armin to Craigie and Debbie. Um, you know, we're, we're always looking for the new musical trends and talking to the artists and customers on, you know, what they need. Because that's what we want to make. We want to we make instruments where you can express yourself. Because drumming and music is nonverbal communication. So we follow the music. Man, and you guys are doing it. Going back to talking with Gene Krupa and getting the uh, getting to hear what the drummers need. And you guys stay on top of the trends. That is absolutely for sure with stacks and all the stuff going on now and the effects symbols and, and everything. But I don't think Zildjian has ever lost sight of where they came from. And um, you're a great ambassador to the company. Well, thank you very much. Awesome. Great talking with you. Great. Thank you, Paul. And until next time um, for part two. But for now, thank you so much for being on the show. We'll talk to you later. Thank you very much. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.